of all the human authors that God used to record the scripture, David is one of the most human. His biographical account in First and Second Samuel and First and Second Kings reveals an ordinary, flawed, and often failing human being who was equally blessed and greatly used by the Lord at the same time. His life is a testimony of God's great mercy and grace. For one thing, David was taken from his ordinary shepherd's life as a young man, anointed to be the future king of England, king of Israel. <laughs> Bless him, Lord. Help him. Help our pastor. The future king of Israel, by God's specific instruction, and then endured years of testing and trial to prepare him for what God had prepared for him. He at once was a favored member of Saul's court, as well as a dis disturbed intruder at times, at least in Saul's mind. For years he lived in exile and was hunted like an animal. When at last he was installed as king, the family of Saul rebelled, at least one of his sons claiming the throne. Finally, after putting down all rebellion, he enjoyed a reign of peace and unparalleled success. David was handsome and he was popular. However, success is not always an asset in the spiritual life. The best of men are still men at their very best. Success and privilege, power and prestige can insulate a person and elevate them to an untouchable status where one's greatest enemy the enemy of self can lead one to reason that they are exempt or special or privileged to violate the clear, unchanging laws of the Word of God. That's why the Holy Spirit records the biographies of these ancient people for us to learn from. We are reminded in Romans that whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we, through the patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. Psalm 5 is called a morning psalm. And we gather as we read through these psalms that they emphasize the morning. You see that theme often in the psalms, the start of each new day. It is best for a believer to begin the day with a time of worship, to recalibrate our thinking, to revive our minds, to set our thoughts aright and the tone for the rest of the day and whatever lies before us in that day. Reminding ourselves of God's timeless and His unfailing, unchanging truths as we begin to plan our day and seek His will. Asking for His help and His guidance is the best and the wisest way to begin every day of our lives. It is a way that we obey the scriptural admonition to teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. Some scholars think that David wrote this psalm during a time of personal crisis. It certainly sounds that way. And some note it specifically to the, at the rebellion of his son Absalom. There are several sons that are, reflect that time in his life who tried to usurp the throne from his father. There are several psalms, as we've mentioned, that hint at this time of David's life. And I would think that was probably the worst of all the experiences he went through. I don't know how you compare the worst of experiences, but that surely was some of the most heartfelt and heartrending. No one has a problem-free life, no matter how successful, how wealthy, how uh, much they have achieved, or what, how beautiful their life may look. There's, it is impossible, it is unthinkable, it is not possible for someone to have a problem-free life. No one raises children or enjoys family life or marriage or love or has relationships without heartache and with, without trials. Whatever has the capacity to bless us has the capacity to, to break our hearts, and that's part of the human condition. Not even a greatly blessed, God-chosen, hand-picked king. And great blessing does not remove the fact that we still are sinners and who moment by moment must deny ourselves as our Lord taught and take up our cross and to follow him and to submit to God's will. 
the superscription here that our reader gave to us to the chief musician upon Neoloth seems to be a notation. It's a musical notation. We must keep in mind that these psalms are prayers and psalms, songs, and it referred to flute accompaniment. That specific psalm, David made that notation. Now, we must address the fact of the so-called imprecatory psalms. As you read through them, you see some, and this one is one that uses very plain language about what David wishes to happen to his enemies. And some people have had great trouble with the so-called imprecatory psalms, asking God's wrath, asking God to deal with rebellion and those who sow the seeds of rebellion. After all, the scripture says God hates those who sow discord among the brethren. He hates rebellion and sinfulness. And so we, we can point to that. But I, we must look at this as we look at this psalm. God asking God to deal with the writer's enemies, to judge them and to punish them, to put them away, to silence them, to give them their just due. Even now, it seems, they're, they're, these psalms sometimes call down the Lord to do something, act immediately. Lord, do, do not delay, not just in the future judgment promised by God. Romans 12, verse 19 reminds us all, though, vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. That is a promise, just like the other glorious promises of his word. We must trust the divine retribution, the divine evening out of all things to the all-wise God who knows the end from the beginning. And that promise is, God says, I will repay. Leah just saying, one day wrongs will be made right. The scripture tells us that. I will repay, saith the Lord. Some are uncomfortable with this kind of language, with these psalms. And some of the enemies of the Lord and the enemies of the scripture would point, for example, to the so-called imprecatory psalms as how could a, a God of justice and love and, and so forth approve of that and allow that to be part of his word. Psalms 3, 4, and 5 are to be taken together. We've not studied them that way, but in your individual study, you might want to remember that. Psalm 3 is a morning prayer. Psalm 4 is an evening prayer. And Psalm 5 is another morning prayer. John Phillips writes, The scene seems to be this. David, having left Jerusalem under cover of night, had conveyed his people across the Jordan and had marched hard all day toward the north to put distance between him and his enemies. Then, worn out and exhausted, he flung himself down and slept for the first time in many hours. He awoke refreshed and was moved to write Psalm 3. The next day was spent crossing the Jabbok River and continuing northward from Jerusalem, a desperate battle lying ahead of him. That evening, he must have written Psalm 4, acknowledging God's goodness and his provision. The next morning, he wrote Psalm 5. He was going to face treacherous foes, enemies that wanted to end his life and his continued reign, and be prepared for such a day with prayer. The psalm should speak to our hearts as we face days. We, we never know what lies before us on any given day. And while David knew he had enemies lurking there, you do too. We have three great enemies, the world, the flesh, and the devil. These are enemies that must be put down. They must be ruthlessly dealt with. And I would ask us today as we consider this psalm for our learning and our admonition in this day of grace and full revelation that we turn those imprecatory thoughts and prayers toward our enemies, the, our flesh, and the, the devil, and the, the world system trying to mold us into its image. These are our greatest enemies, and they never leave. They never let up as long as we're in these bodies and here in this life. As G. Campbell Morgan notes, we face no day which is not filled with the possibility of danger. Not even God's choicest servants, not the king of Israel, the hand-picked king of Israel. I want us to examine the psalm before us as a pattern for our own praying and service. I hope you use the psalms that way. I think we probably refer to the, script, the psalms more than any other portion of scripture to find a vent for our emotions, words that would frame our own thoughts and there we often find the Holy Spirit inspired words to express 
the, the, our own hearts and thoughts. They're recorded for us to help us worship. This is the hymn book of Israel. And they're there for us, for our learning and admonition, for our praise, for our devotion, and for our praying, and for our own, to help us, guide us in our own private kingdoms with struggles with others and enemies in our own selves and these enemies that I have mentioned here. So our enemies are just as great as David's, and we may not be king, but we, are, uh, we have our own lives, our own families, our own responsibilities, and we must set things aright. And only the Word of God can do that for us, to help us prioritize what to do, where to go, how to act, what decisions to make. How we start each day is a major impact on how we will live throughout the rest of the day. If we don't get it right then, just a few moments if necessary, I know that many of you live very busy lives, you're in the workforce, you're teaching, or whatever it may be, and yet I would appeal to all of us to start the day as David did early in seeking the Lord's face. First of all, I want us to, to consider then the morning watch. We'll refer to that time of worship and recalibration and praise and prayer as the morning watch. I often refer to that in my own life, that devotion time is the morning watch. We see that in verses 1. Give ear to my words, O Lord, and consider my med meditation. Hearken unto the voice of my cry, my King and my God, for unto thee will I pray. My voice shalt thou hear in the morning, O Lord. And so it's, we have good uh, account to do that. David said, in the morning. He's going to fight a battle, folks. I mean, with bows and arrows and whatever, swords and knives and, and with real enemies. And if David had time to set a time in the morning watch to, to, to seek the Lord's face and to defend the Lord's cause, certainly we should as well. You will hear my voice in the morning, O Lord. In the morning, he repeats it, will I direct my prayer unto thee and when I will look up. We're so busy looking down and here, at our stuff and our things and our problems, we ought to be looking upward, heavenward uh, to the Lord. I will lift my eyes into the hills from whence cometh my help. Now, a watch was a period of time. The Jews had the divided the day into three basic periods of time. The Roman influence later, there were four watches, but it was a period of time. And the Jewish day was calibrated by the starting the so-called first hour. The first hour began at dawn, about 72 minutes before sunrise was when they calibrated it. And the day ended sh uh, shortly after the sunset of the first medium-sized stars as they began to appear. That was the end of a day. That was considered the day. The point being, David, with all the turmoil, with all the pressures with his kingdom at stake and about to be possibly taken from him and seeking the, the mind of the Lord, what would he do if his son, if this is the time when he's fighting against Absalom, would he take his life? These are pressing things. These are heart-rending things that David is facing. And the time constraints and all that faces him going on in his life, he took some time early in his day to pour out his heart and his feelings before the Lord and to commune with him. I can think of no more important thing you will ever do on any day than that. This was part of the reason I believe that he's referred to by the Holy Spirit as a man after God's own heart that, that has a picture of pursuing God. It does not mean that David was perfect, but he was a repenter from beginning to end and he was always pursuing the Lord. He knew his frailties. He knew himself. And he, he knew he needed the Lord's help. And this is what it, it is to describe a person after God's heart. After the mind of the Lord and the ways of the Lord. Desiring it for ourselves and our lives. He openly tells the Lord how he feels. He admits his pain within him. There, this is a painful cry uh, throughout the, the psalm here. His prayer is clearly a, a cry for divine help. And though David was king of Israel, he knew very well that Jehovah was the king of kings, and only he could set things right. Only he could change this uh, horrible time in his life. And he came before the absolute sovereign one. No matter how successful you are, no matter how powerful you are, 
And no matter how well you've ordered your life, there's some people who seem to have this idea if they just plan and do the right thing and, and order their lives, and they're very meticulous that somehow they can escape these things. It's impossible. That's a lie from Satan. And we should plan and be meticulous and seek the Lord and do the right thing. But that does not exempt us from these heart-rending, horrible situations that will befall all of us in the, the human race. We will encounter some kinds of heart-rending things like this before we're taken home. He knew that all he really needed, only God could supply. What is it, difference does it make being a king when you're in exile? You're, you're running for your life. In verse 3, in the morning will I direct my prayer to thee and will look up or eagerly watch that looking up. I'm waiting for you, Lord. I, I need your direction. Give me your direction. Show me your favor. Smile upon me. Show us the route to take. All of these things. We are invited to come before God's throne boldly. We, sang, we open this time of worship with before the throne of God above. One of the greatest privileges of a child of God is to do what Hebrews 4.16 tells us to do. Let us, therefore, because the, the, the high priest has gone in once and for all and has become the sacrifice and paid the debt, and because of that, we can come boldly. That's not brashness. It's not our boldness. It's boldness in the finished work of Christ our Savior. His work answers to any problem or any accusation from the wicked one, any frailty in our hearts and lives. We can come boldly because of the finished work of our Savior. Let us come boldly into the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. And then in verse 19 of that chapter, having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, something no Old Testament believer ever had the privilege to do. They never, one of them, but the high priest only on the Day of Atonement ever went into the Holy of Holies. They never saw the Ark of the Covenant. That was totally off limits. But praise the Lord. When our great sacrifice died in our place and he cried, it is finished. Do you remember what happened? The great veil that separated the holy place from the holy of holies. Josephus said it was as thick as a man's hand. It was tall as this building. It was ripped from the top to the bottom. And therefore, God's saying, come, come and worship me. Come and do what the, in the Old Testament worshiper, there was all kinds of fences and reminders that they could only go so far. We are invited no matter where we are, we can come right into the throne room of God. And we are to do so. If King David, who had all the wealth and the armies and the power, felt compelled to begin his day his, with the morning watch, how much more should we? The morning watch. But secondly, I want us to notice how David's great desire to follow the Lord, he expresses there in verses 4 through 6, Thou art not a God that hath pleasure in wickedness. Do you see how David pleads his cause? He knows what he's praying He's not just shooting out in the dark. He's appealing to the attributes of God, the righteousness of God. And that's why I felt so compelled for us to study the attributes of God, what our God is like. He's not basing his prayers on his personal feelings. I've got enemies. They're causing me to have a hard time. I'd really like to be back on my throne in Jerusalem. It's very inconvenient to be, in, you know, all the things that the reason we like for our problems to go away is because of the inconvenience and how bad we feel. But David appeals at the rightful place. I know what you're like. You're a God who hates sin. And this is sin. You have ordained me to be king. This is your will. This is your kingdom. These are your people. Do you see how David prays intelligently? God, you're a God who hates. You have no pleasure in wickedness. Neither shall evil dwell with thee. The foolish shall not stand in thy sight. This is foolishness. Thou hatest all workers of iniquity. His own son he's praying about, who's, if this is the case, who's usurping the throne. Thou shalt destroy them that speak lying or leasing. And the Lord will abhor the bloody and the deceitful man. He get, but continues to plead his cause before the throne of God. Nothing pleases the Lord like our taking him at his word. 
He loves his word. He's exalted it above his own name. Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. And when we come to him, when you come to plead your case before an earthly judge, you gather your documents, your deeds, your stuff. You bring, if you have to go to an audit, you gather all the stuff, all the proofs, all the giving, all the, 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 the things, and you bring them and lay them out. You remember the, the widow who was pleading her case in Luke 18. She came every day with her case. Do you know why? Because she was convinced it was absolutely right. I've always thought it was a real estate matter. Someone had seized her property. She was a widow. She had nothing else. But whatever it was, it was desperate. And she knew her rights. She knew what was right. And she knew that the law was on her side. And she came before that judge. He was an earthly judge who was capricious, who could hear the case if he wanted to. He kept sending her away and sending her away. But she knew her case. She knew her standing. She knew what was hers. She knew what was her right, her privileges. Do you know them, child of God? Oh, gather the, the word of God. Gather the verses. Gather the promises and lay them before the throne of grace. Have you not said, is this not your will? He prays in that way. In verses 5 through 6 and verses 9 through 10, we see a group of people who wish David harm. Do you know that the world and the devil wish you harm? They're actively seeking his removal, his demise. They want his job. They want to ruin and destroy him. They blaspheme God and ignore his word and think nothing about it. Like so many around us today, we must I remind ourselves today that God hates sin and, and wrongdoing, and we have the right for, to, to pray that he would make things right and, and may have, will be done. It takes regular exposure to God's word to keep us calibrated and informed and to dismantle the lies that we hear. We hear them all day long. That's all Satan has. He's a liar, the Lord said from the beginning, and he just does nothing but manufacture lies. And often when we are troubled in our thinking and away from the Lord and things are not right, I would appeal to you, child of God, always ask the Lord with an open copy of his word, Lord, am I believing some lie of Satan? Am I following some untruth, the fiery dart of the wicked one that would pierce in? And Lord, I lift the shield of faith, which you said well, is able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. Oh, we must constantly... Go through our thinking and measure it by the word of God and always ask ourselves, what saith the Lord? Is this from the Lord or is this from Satan? Is it some manufacturing of Satan's, uh, his lying coming my direction? We must daily, the problem is we daily must deal with people who are that opposed to us and to our position, the things that we hold dear, the teachings of God's word. The very things I'm preaching this morning is considered hate speech by the world. And they twist the words and invent new meanings. And we have to navigate. Some of you are in positions where you have to navigate through all of that stuff every day. Oh, we need the wisdom of God, do we not? To deal with these things and to be true to our Lord at the same time. We must daily deal with those who would dismantle the things we hold dear. And, and will openly take it out on us. God expects those who love him to love what he loves and to hate what he hates. Not Psalm 97, verse 10, Ye that love the Lord hate evil. He preserves the souls of his saints. He delivers them out of the hand of the wicked. There's a promise. Claim it. Lord, you've said you would preserve me and deliver me out of the hand of the wicked. Amen. Warren Wearsby says, If we want to fellowship with God at his holy altar, then we need to feel the same anguish or anger plus love as we see the evil in this fallen world. And so we ask for God's will to be done, to silence the, the, the gainsayers, to stop their influence. This is praying intelligently. And we're all in, in, in involved in this kind of warfare every day. If, you're, if you don't sense that, I don't know where, where you are or what you're doing. If you love the Lord and know his word, your righteous soul, even Lot's righteous soul was vexed. It's hard to tell it, but the scripture tells us it was. His righteous soul was vexed. By all that was 
counted worthy and common and, and good in his day. And that, that day of, of, in, in, there in Sodom where he lived and, and homosexuality was prominent. He was vexed by it. But what a sad picture Lot is. And we should not be that way. We should pray and plead the promises of God. Thirdly, we see in verses 7 through 12 what David actually prayed to the Lord. Notice the turning point there in verse 7. But as for me, we can't do mo hardly anything about 90-something percent of the th stuff that happens. But we have absolute control over how we will respond, what we will think, how we will order our lives, our homes, our families. As for me, sounds like Joshua, doesn't it? As for me, in my house, we will serve the Lord. Oh, husbands, fathers, mothers, take up this mantle. It used to be the watchword of the church. Unapologetically holding high the banner of the Lord. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. I will come into thy house in the multitude of thy mercy. In thy fear will I worship toward thy holy temple. Now, you know as well as I do, if David is in exile, he can go nowhere near the tabernacle. The temple had not yet been built, but in his heart he had. Wherever David was, like wherever the child of God is, we can worship the Lord and be there in the Holy of Holies. And he, he, this is a turning point here. Notice there, but as for me, and at the end of it all, all we can really do anything about is ourselves. And the only thing that, correct can, that can correct me and you and straighten us out is God's word, the power of his word. What can we do? Well, first we can pray for God's guidance. We can come to the house of the Lord. The throne room of God is the place of prayer wherever we are. And in thy fear will I worship toward thy holy temple. Worship is a priority for the child of God. It, it is the, the, the major reason we've been left here. It is the focus of our life. Our whole life should be a doxology of prayer and praise and worship to the Lord. I was at an appointment on Friday, and I was sitting there... And then the nurse, I had never seen her before, and she just couldn't figure me out. She asked me questions and so forth. And finally, she just said, and I was, I don't know why she said this. I just had a plain, you know, dress shirt on and pants. I mean, that may be, I don't know what it was, but she said, you look like you do something important. I thought, well, she asked, she's made the statement, and we pray every day to have opportunity to witness. She said, you just look like you do something important. What do you do? I said, okay, you ask. <laughs> and I was able to share with her, her what I did. The most important thing of all is to tell other people about the Lord, isn't it? And we can get so bogged down with all that's going on around us, we forget that's why we were left here, to glorify him and to make his gospel known. And he says there in verse 8, lead me, O Lord, in thy righteousness because of mine enemies. Although David was in exile, he could come before the Lord in the same reverential way that the priest could in the tabernacle. It was just as important. And you can as well. He might not could have blended his voice with the thousands of the Levites who were singing at the tabernacle, but he could lift his lone voice to the praise and the honor and the glory of his great Savior. One thing is for sure, David needs God's guidance, doesn't he? Don't you agree that David, if anybody, he's in a bad place. But I want you to know you are as well. I am as well. We need to know, Lord, do I go or stay? Do I come or do I help? Tell me what to do. Secondly, he asked David, he asked God to deal with those who wished him harm. And we see that in verses 9. There is no faithfulness in their mouth, Lord. Their inward part is very wickedness. And their throat is an open sepulcher. They, they flatter with their tongue. Destroy them, Lord. And I think we could ask the Lord to destroy the influence of those who are trying to tear down the work of the Lord and do his work harm. Does the scripture say pray for them that have the rule over us that we might what? Lead a quiet and peaceable life. We must pray this way. Destroy them. Let them fall by their own counsels. Let the traps and the snares and the philosophy and the lies and the rumors they're sowing, let them get caught up in their own snare, their own net, for they have rebelled against you. David is not praying this for his own welfare. It's a larger thing than that. This is bigger than you or me. This is the Lord's work. It is his cause. It is the gospel of Christ. It is the church of Christ. 
Now, to be sure, God had made David king. And to be sure, God has called you to the kingdom for such a time as this. And your part in that kingdom is appointed by the Lord, just as important as what David's position was. To attack his throne was to attack God's will. And as John Phillips notes, this was not a prayer for revenge against his foes. The spirit of David rose far higher than that. Within a few days, David would withhold his hand from executing even Shimei, who cursed him so violently. He, he, when he had the opportunity to, he didn't do that. He would plead, too, with Joab and his generals to deal gently with Absalom, his son. David knew that God knew best how to destroy the influence and the power of those who were seeking to destroy him. We can go right to the throne room, tell him all about it, lay it out before him. I must tell Jesus. I must tell Jesus. He is a kind, compassionate friend. I must tell him all my troubles, all that wound the heart. God does avenge David, by the way. And it is God who takes out Absalom. It must remind us when we pray biblically and when we ask the Lord to do whatever it takes for righteousness and justice to prevail. I'm sure David never wanted it to be Absalom's life, but he had transferred his case to the Supreme Court of Heaven. And the judge of all the earth, he can only do that which is right. He settled the matter once and for all. We must be willing, when we pray scripturally, to allow the Lord to have his way. And to say, even as Eli, when he heard that his sons, his rebellious sons, were going to be taken, what was Eli's response? It is the Lord. Let him do what seemeth him good. This is not flippant, getting even kind of praying. David's desire was for the righteousness of God, the holiness of God. God's reputation among the heathen was at stake when his people were at war. He prays for God's justice in verses 9 through 10, and, and so may we. Always keep in mind how patient and gracious and long-suffering, as we'll see tonight, that God has been toward us. Oh, the patience of God. It's one of the least referred to attributes, but we would not be here today if it wasn't for the patience, the long-suffering of God towards sinners. How long did God put up with you until your heart was melted? And you bowed before the cross of Christ and submitted to his will and his reign in your life. How long? What all did he put up with in your life to bring you to that place of repentance? And I might add, as we all look in our own lives, what all has the Lord endured with us since then? Oh, how often we have to go and claim the precious promises if we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Probably the most well-worn promise in the Bible is that one. How many times, how many times a day do we have to plead for God's grace? Lastly, in verses 11 and 12, David asked for God to bless. Oh, how we need the blessing of God. I may not know how to adequately define it, but I, I know what it is. It's something we so desperately need, and only God can give it. We need his blessing in our church, don't we? We need his blessing in our homes, in our marriages, the favor of God, the hand of God, the will of God. And he prays there that all those that put their trust in thee rejoice. And that's a good pastoral prayer. That's a prayer I pray for you. Let all your people who put their trust in you rejoice. Oh, Folks, let's be a rejoicing people. Let's make up our minds. Whatever happens, we will sing God's praise and lift his voice, lift our voices to, to the praise of our God. Let them shout for joy. Don't we have much to shout for? We know how it's going to end. King Jesus will be enthroned and rule and reign, and he will right every wrong and put down every instance of rebellion. Because thou defendest them, let them also that love thy name be joyful. In thee. Shouldn't we be joyful? 
I think it's a bad testimony for us not to be. We ought to be rejoicing and joyful all the time. For thou, Lord, will bless the righteous. That's the promise. Lord, you said you would bless the righteous. I don't have any righteousness. You've given it to me, but you promised to bless the righteous. That's why I can confidently, I walk through this empty auditorium every time before we meet. And it says, Lord, bless these people. They're your people. Feed them. Revive them. Protect them. And bless us, O oh Lord, Amen. with favor. Wilt thou compass? That's like a, a garrison surrounded and protected with blessing and favor. Thou will compass him as with a shield. Notice his great confidence. We can rejoice in our God. We can rejoice in his character, in his word, where his prom he promises to bless and to make things right eventually. We can rejoice in answered prayer. And we can rejoice in unanswered prayer, knowing that in his time and his way, he will take care of every bit of it. David began this morning watch, this time of daily worship, asking for help for himself, for God to deal with his enemies, to shut them up, to stop their influence, to thwart their plans, to do whatever it would take for his name and his will and his honor to go forth. And then he ends up by pleading with the Lord to bless his people. For thou, Lord, will bless the righteous. With favor wilt thou compass him as with the shield. Now, may I say here, if you know not the Lord, you're an enemy of God. The Bible says we are enemies of God if we have not submitted to his lordship in our lives. And so many people around us are fighting their own private battle with God, lifting their puny fist in God's face. I will have my own way. I'll live my life the way I want to. You'll never be at peace. You'll never know the peace that God desires for those who have made right with him until you come before the Lord, surrendering to him as Lord and Savior, making him the Lord of your life. To as many as received him, to them gave he the power to become the sons of God, even to as many as believed on his name. Oh, gracious Lord, how your word speaks to every part of us, every part of our lives. We pray for this morning hymn, this morning song. May it bless us. May we take it up, Lord, as our own pattern for prayer. Lord, we don't know what to ask for us often, but we want your will to be done. We want you to be glorified, your people to be edified. Oh, bless your church, your gathered people today, Lord. We've laid aside this time to honor and glorify your name. Remind us that the whole day is the Lord's day. And may we, Lord, dedicate it to you, reflect on these glorious truths. Lord, work in us and work that out of us, Lord, that which you've worked in us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.